Uh, last week, you recall, we looked into the essence of man. We saw how man is constructed. Uh, oh, pardon, we looked at the goal of man. Uh, what did God want to do with man after he'd made him? We saw that God created man to be fruitful in everything that he did, to multiply, specifically a biological task, and to subdue the earth and the sea and the sky all to the glory of God. That that ultimately is the meaning of history. Uh, now that we know God's goal with man, it will, I think, enable us to better understand why God made man the way in which he did. Why are we made the way that we are? Why do we have a nose and eyes and hair and a soul and toenails? And if we analyze all these things that we have in depth, I think we'll begin to see that each thing that God has given us plays a role in enabling us to reach the goal that God had in mind when he created man. Uh, let's just um, give a bird's eye view of the nature of man then. In the first place, man is the image of God. Now, we do know quite a lot about man but we don't know as much about God as we, as we should. Looking at ourselves in the mirror, studying ourselves, being honest with ourselves and our thoughts and our desires, looking at other people and evaluating them, we can learn quite a lot about man. But if we understand that man is the image of God, uh, it must mean that there's some kind of a relationship between God and man whose image uh, God and man who is the image of God. Uh, so, by learning more about man, you're actually learning more about God. When you study man, you're studying the small-scale model of God himself. Conversely, what the scriptures teach us about God, which we couldn't know from any other source, is faintly reflected in every man. So we're told that God made man in his own image, we're told uh, very importantly, I think, in Genesis 9, after the fall, that we are not to murder our fellow human being. Uh, not for humanity's sake, that's not the reason that's given. But we are not to murder our fellow human being because he is the image of God. In the image of God he is created. And therefore, he who kills other men by man, the image of God, shall his blood be shed, because in the image of God did God create that man. Here you can see the link-up. We're to treat one another as human beings with respect, because we're God's image, which is a tremendous statement. Uh, now, man is a small-scale reflection of God. Everything that God does on a vast scale, man does on a small scale. God creates the sun, the moon, and the stars, and keeps them going. And we're told in Psalm 8 that he made man just a little less than a divine being, rather poorly translated, a little less than angels in many Bible translations. But it's me Elohim in the Hebrew, which means literally that man has been created just a little less than a divine being. And he's been created, uh, all things have been put under his feet. Even the sun and the moon and the stars, which God created, and which man, who is the image of this God, is now himself to subdue. So, in dominating the universe, man is to reflect God. So, too, we're given that interesting statement in Ecclesiastes 3. It's a time for everything under the sun, a time to play, a time to uh, embrace, a time to pick up rocks, a time to throw them away. And then this statement, which Doeviet makes so much of, <coughs> that God has put the age, the olam, the centuries, the world, uh, in the heart of man, so that no man can, by reflecting on it, totally exhaust it and find it out. The universe, as it were, is locked up inside the heart of man, but then the centuries, the ages of human cultural history, in terms of which he reflects, about the whole of this universe and every part of it is also in the heart of in the heart of man 
and we can't exhaust this. And we're all that way, even those of us who are not Christians. We have an insatiable thirst for knowledge and an inquisitiveness. That is to say, if we haven't been so drugged by the, the television set that we, we have no uh, uh, more soaring aims than just to watch the, the box all day long, but those of us who haven't gone that route, who are not enslaved to drugs, are inquisitive. Whether we love the Lord or not, that's because we reflect God, and that's what makes us expansive. Now, the next statement, and this is very important, is man does not possess the image of God. The image of God is not a small part or even the major part of man. Man is the image of God, and the image of God is man. This is very important. The image of God is not something locked inside of your chest somewhere, which flies away from your corpse when you're dead. The image of God is you, and you are the image. The whole man is the whole image. It's terribly important. Uh, when we read expressions such as, God made man in his image, after his likeness, and then a little later, in his likeness and after his image, this is a Hebrewism, uh, which doesn't mean that man is less than the image of God or more than the image of God or has the image of God tacked on to him. doesn't mean, as the Roman Catholics believe, that the image of God is something like a, um, a jacket uh, which God gives to man after creating him. God makes a man who's not the image of God and then God says, Oh, I forgot. Here's something in addition for you. A jacket, the image of God. Put it on, Adam. Now, be a good boy, because if you fall, I'm going to take away the jacket. Now, you've fallen, and you've lost the image of God, but you're still a man. Almost totally undisturbed by sin. And, of course, when you get baptized, why? Then you get the image of God back again. And, of course, you can lose it after baptism if you're not a good Christian. Uh... The image, therefore, is not a jacket, it's not a, a bridle. That's a very popular word with uh, medieval Roman Catholic theologians, a bridle. That God creates a man who's purely human, who's not the image of God, and then, and this is very interesting, to prevent concupiscence breaking out in man, to prevent the animal nature breaking out in man, God bridles him, by giving him this image. And then when he falls into sin, of course, he loses the bridle, and then, then things get bad. Well, uh, you can see that if you believe that, and that's official Romish teaching, that it's very easy to proceed from that position to accepting evolution. Because if man before the fall had some kind of animal tendencies in him, which are not sinful, but which are concupiscence, which is less than sin. It's a desire, a tendency towards evil, not in itself evil. Then it must mean that man was not originally uh, altogether good and pure prior to the fall. Which is why Roman Catholics have less problems in uh, accepting the theory of evolution than do Bible-believing Protestants. Now, the whole man is the whole image of God. Uh, this has important implications, because if the image of God is exclusively in the soul of man, you could take the position that it's not such a terrible thing to kill a man's body, as long as you don't kill or destroy his soul. And of course, if everyone believed that, society would be in a desperate position. But when you take the view that your entire personality... Every part of your body is the image of God. You've got to treat the whole man with dignity and respect. I'm not saying that each part of our personality, still less each part of our body, is equally important. Obviously, your head and your brain are more centrally important than your little toe. But I am saying with Calvin that the image of God extends to every part of man's personality and to every part of his body. Implications are that we must serve the Lord, as Paul says in Romans 12, to offer our bodies 
not just our souls, our bodies, as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. Well, I see I've already anticipated that and dealt with the image of God in the body. But just one of those texts there, Psalm 94, verse uh, 9. Should he who made the eye not himself see? Should he who made the ear not himself hear? Now, this doesn't mean that we should, with the Mormons, think of God as some colossal kind of a human being sitting up in the sky with eyes and ears like us. Because we are only the image of God. We are not God. We are not the same as God. We don't have the same structure of God, but there is a resemblance between us. Of course, God doesn't need an eye. If he had an eye, even if that eye was as big as our Milky Way, there would be parts of God that were not eye, not an eye, and this would mean that God was not all-seeing and not all-knowledgeable. The entire of, uh, entirety of God must be I. The entirety of God must be here. The entirety of God must be heart to love and so forth. And to have that, you cannot materialize God. You cannot uh, pin him down as if he's matter. But when we're dealing with a human being, we're dealing with a small scale image of God. A creature that is like God, but not God. Uh... Whereas God fills the universe, man on a much smaller scale fills a body of approximately 180 pounds, six foot tall, or whatever it is, the average man, and has the average human eyes and the average human ears and the average human brain, like God, and yet vastly different. It's necessary for God to give us a localized eye. If our eye was so acute that it could see everything going on in the universe at the same time, we would be like God. But we're not built that way. And so the structure of our body not only reveals the glory of God, but it also makes us aware of our own limitations. And that's good, because it keeps us humble. And it keeps us dependent upon the Lord. On the other hand, as Calvin says, at the very beginning of the Institutes, no man can look at himself or at his fellow man, without him examining himself, being forced to look upward to the one who made him thus. You can't survey your hand very long uh, without feeling in your conscience that this hand that only has a little power somehow faintly reflects the all-powerful one who made the universe. Now, if we're saying that the image of God does reside in the eye and in the hand and in the toe of man, we're not in any way saying that the image of God does not reside particularly in the soul. Of course it does. The soul is the most central part of man. If uh, uh, a circular saw uh, lops off your arm or your hand, or if you have a foot amputated, you, the you in the you, is still behind. Uh, your, your foot's lying over there, and it was your foot. I guess it still is. You can't do much with it after it's been chopped off. And somehow, in a very wonderful way, the soul, which is not material, which did fill the whole of that foot, which is now lopped off, shrunk, it seems to me, at the very moment that the, that the limb was lopped off. So there's not part of your soul residing in that lopped off foot. Uh, you are centrally still here. Of course, you should treat the foot with dignity and not lop it off or throw it away. Uh, the image of God resides everywhere in man's personality, but particularly in the soul. And it can shrink within the man, the image, the, the centrality of the image of God, and it can expand. As we're successful in our work and in our achievements, the image of God in us, that is us, we ourselves expand. So it does a child, as the child grows up, even physically. In older age, we tend to shrink a little. And after an accident, we shrink quite a lot. Now, the personality of man and the body of man and the soul of man, it seems to me, are a creaturely reflection of the triuneness of God himself. Uh, awful debate between theologians as to whether man is a one-part being, a two-part being, or a three-part being. And I think the answer... The real answer from Scripture must be 
He's neither one part, two part, nor three part. He's three in one. Same way that God is. Because we're the image of God and we resemble him in that respect. Exactly how we reflect him, I'm not altogether sure on the detail. But clearly, your body is not the same as your soul. And yet they're intimately connected with one another and presuppose one another. And your personality is not quite the same as your body, your soul, because your personality extends to your body too. Uh, the the uh, texture of our hair, the color of our eyes, the size of our tummies, somehow expresses our personality. And yet it's not the same as the personality. Now, the next section, man's nature, is fully agreeable with his purpose. This is so important. God creates man to dominate the earth. In all the variety of ways we looked at very briefly last week. Therefore, God gives man a nature entirely agreeable with the purpose. In other words, when God is going to require man to live for the purpose of being fruitful, fructification, he must have a human personality. If we human beings had no personality, we couldn't be fruitful. And by fruitful here, I don't mean biologically fruitful. I mean the ability to expand our interests and our uh, and to develop uh, in in as many directions as we possibly can. If we have no personality, we can't do that. When you see a human being who has a stunted or a weak personality, you find that he's stunted in his growth. He can't unfold. He may be antisocial and crawl into his shell, or or he may be so unsure of himself is super social and can, cannot bear being alone away from people. This is the kind of person that's got to have the radio or the TV on 24 hours a day or he goes insane. Uh, the problem here is a personality problem. And when our lives do not show an expansion and an increase in interests and in the acquisition of, uh, of uh, wealth and knowledge and... Uh, and other things that human beings do, we have a problem of not being fruitful with the talents God's given us. That's a personality problem at the base. Second, God requires us to multiply biologically. Therefore, he gives us a human body, including the uh, parts of our body that uh, are used to propagate the race. They're there for a purpose. God also requires us to subdue the earth. Now, the word subdue is very interesting. In uh, Genesis 1, it's the Hebrew word radar, which literally means to grind something down under your foot. You know, when uh, Muhammad Ali has knocked out George Foreman, uh, then he puts his foot on top of his neck, the winner and still champion. Well, that's the idea of dominating. Of course, it's wrong to dominate human beings. We should only dominate non-human creatures, but the root idea is very strong in Genesis 1, to put your foot on something and assert your lordship over it. A little later, in uh, Genesis 9, where this is repeated, God says, I have put all the birds of the air and the fish of the sea into your hand, into your power. So here we, we have mention of the foot of man and the hand of man. In order to dominate the earth, we need a foot to carry us over the earth, to assert our authority, to locomote, to peregrinate, to walk about. And we also need a hand to do things, and to exercise authority and to make things. Without a hand, we couldn't dominate. That's why God gives us a hand and a foot. Third, man is to glorify God with all that he does. And therefore, he has a human soul. Without a soul as the motor, as it were, to drive the body, the hand, the foot, uh, the reproductive parts, uh, we would be dead, as we read in James. The body without the soul is dead. And that's why you need an enlivened soul driving your body in order to be able to glorify God. Now, personality of man drives the soul and, and the body to cause it to multiply, to subdue, 
uh, to form nations, to honor God, and to do all the other thousand and one things that human beings do and should do to God's glory alone. The personality of man, the soul of man, the body of man are all needed as a triune uh, unit in order for man to unfold and reach the eschatological goal that God has set for him, the reason why God made man. And notice that uh, as we multiply and form nations, we begin to see that God's goal with me uh, is not to be separated from God's goal with the rest of humanity, because I am part of humanity. I'm distinguishable from the rest of humanity, but I'm part of it. Therefore, my goal of my life should be in harmony with, with my neighbor's goal, if he's a Christian, and this can only be so if we're both looking upward and being driven forward toward the same goal in cooperation with one another. Dr. Barthink writes in one of his books very well, I think, that the full image of God can never be demonstrated and displayed in one individual alone. The full image of God will only be seen in all of its splendor when the last member of the human race has been born and has grown to maturity. You need the entirety of humanity to display all of the facets of the full image of God. Well, when we remember that, we begin to get respect for our neighbor because we see in him God's image in ourself as part of this mighty, developing humanity created by God to glorify him. And, of course, God's control over us is so exact down to the last uh, detail that even though the majority of people are unregenerate and unchristians today God is still very much in control of their life and he is causing the wrath of man to praise him God is being praised even by the works that the unbeliever does even by the sinful works that the unbeliever does to his glory, according to his own predestinated counsel. When you consider the depth of this, it uh, boggles the mind, and yet it's true. God is in total control of the history of humanity as we unfold. Well, now, there's a basic unity between personality, body, and soul, but this is not a uniformity. Personality, body, and soul are different, but they are in harmonious cooperation with one another, just as Father, Son, and Spirit are different within the Trinity, but are in harmonious cooperation with one another, because man is the image of this triune God. Now, there is, of course, a difference in the rate of growth, uh, particularly after the fall of the personality and the body and the mind. Um, the difference... Well, let me just say this at first. Uh, you notice in your adolescent children or grandchildren how when they reach adolescence, the body seems to grow a lot, lot faster than the soul, and particularly that aspect of the soul known as the mind or the emotions. And uh, we're like that. As a result of fall, we're in tension. And the secret of the thing is to get a harmonious development of the whole human being. But even when the Lord saves us, if we're mature people when the Lord saves us. There's a difference in the time of the regeneration of the soul as opposed to the time of the regeneration of the body. Our soul's regenerated the moment we believe in Jesus. Our body is only regenerated at the coming of Christ long after our death when our body is raised from the dead. And yet the two interact. It's my theory that if a person becomes saved when they're 35 and they serve the Lord as best they know how after that, their body, although it will continue to degenerate, will do so at a lesser tempo than it would have done had the person not gotten saved and had their soul not been regenerated. And once the center of our being, our soul, gets regenerated, of course, the regeneration from there is to extend throughout the whole of our body in spite of indwelling sin, in spite of the mess we've made of our lives before the Lord straightened us out, and then to proceed from our physical bodies, as it were, as we project ourselves in our deeds and our activities into the world. In this sense, regeneration has tremendous impact and consequences 
as it is projected by the person so regenerated into his environment uh, which surrounds him. Yet although one can distinguish between the rate of growth of bodies and souls and the rate of degeneration, man is a package deal and uh, he is essentially one, although not uniform. Point seven is, of uh, B is very important. There's a lot of misunderstanding on this point. The personality, the body, and the soul of man are all mortal. That means they can all die. And yet, none of them can be annihilated. That means totally destroyed so nothing is left of them. Often we hear Christians speak of the immortality of the soul. I have an immortal soul. Many catechisms are constructed in this way. The soul is immortal. We need to be very careful in making statements like that. Uh, what do we mean when we say the soul is immortal? If we mean that it, once created, can never be annihilated, of course we're right. But then the body is also immortal in that sense. When we fall into sin, our body starts to decay. Uh, when it's buried in the grave, it decomposes, but it's not annihilated. And from the very same particles of which our body is presently composed, Christ, on the day of judgment, will reconstruct a glorified human body. You say, yes, but the soul doesn't get decomposed. Well, not in the material sense, because the soul isn't material at all. It's spiritual, and yet the soul does decompose. When a person becomes a sinner, his soul becomes wicked. And we need to understand that sin does not really reside in our bodies as much as it resides in our souls. It's our souls that get corrupt and our souls that die when they become separated from God in their misery. And it's our soul that lives again. Before our body starts to live again, there's a time lag, but it's our soul that lives again when it gets regenerated. And certainly, our soul will be as much rearranged, if we could use that word, when Christ comes again, as the particles of our body will be arranged at that time. So, let's be careful when we speak of the immortality of the soul. It is immortal in the sense that it can't be annihilated, but so is the body. Now, the human personality, the origin of human personality, and when we say personality, we mean the I-ness, the thing that makes you, you, and not me. When does the I start? Well, the Mormons will tell you, before you were conceived, nine months prior to your birth, your I, your personality, was in a different realm altogether where it was conscious but when it came into the body and got trapped in the body uh, the knowledge of the previous world was obliterated and of course Plato believed this too that's where the Mormons get it from and from oriental religion in general uh, but when you push them still further you'll find that the Mormons believe that these intelligences as they call them uh, actually existed prior to Genesis 1 verse 1 which really means that your I is not part of creation it's an uncreated eternal non-divine being alongside of God well that is Aristotle and that's a very dangerous position no I think we're going to have to say with scripture that our I our ego our personality originated at conception. Uh, this is important when you deal with issues like abortion, of course, when the personality of the fetus uh, is introduced. And while I admit that Scripture is not absolutely clear on this, I think there is a tremendous amount of evidence in Scripture which suggests that the very moment of conception uh, is... Uh, the time when our personality in embryo is formed, that the body and the soul come into being at the identical time. I'd go a little further. I'd say that which makes the, the material aspect of the fetus uh, alive is 
the indwelling of the soul. The fetus couldn't move if there was no soul inside of it. Couldn't exchange its blood with a mother's blood were the soul not already in the fetus, it seems to me. Well, we're told in Psalm 139 that God fashioned me in my mother's womb. Uh, Luke 1 is, is uh, very fascinating. Uh, I'll just give you the outline of that one. could spend half an hour just with the details of Luke 1, but we've got, we won't do it. But you recall that just after Mary was told that she would uh, conceive and bring forth the Son of God, she went to visit uh, her cousin Elizabeth, whom the record tells us was already six months pregnant, carrying John the Baptist. And then we read a fascinating story that when Mary walked into the room, Elizabeth felt her own child, John the Baptist, jump up for joy when he, John the Baptist, sensed, somehow became aware of, not the presence of Mary, but the presence of the one who had just entered into Mary's womb. Now that wonderful story teaches us not only that John the Baptist had personality three months prior to his own birth, but that Jesus Christ had personality nine months, or almost nine months, prior to his birth. Now, I think that that's the strongest text that we can use on this whole uh, tremendous battle that we're involved in, in, in in abortion today. So much for the origin of personality. The nature of personality as I said, is the I which distinguishes us from every other I and from all the non-I in the universe, and especially from all other persons or faces. It seems in Scripture that um, the personality is associated with the face. In Greek, prosopon uh, is a personality which literally means a mask that an actor wears uh, in a Greek play. Uh, actor meaning you project your face and your personality uh, your face so too we're often told in scripture that um, the prophets desired to see the face of the Lord or show me your face, the personality and in a very central way our face does express the kind of person that we are the eyes are mirrors of the soul and of course some people can't help their face and particularly if they've had an accident now, when I was a little boy of four, a huge uh, fireplace fell on me and fractured my skull. I didn't think I would live, and it tore a nerve here, and this mark on my cheek is the result of it. And if I get very tired, I wink. So if there's pretty girls around, I have to warn them in advance <laughs> when I'm real tired. Well, I can't help that. And we've all got some or other hang-up like that. But nevertheless, our face expresses the kind of person that we are. It really does. And I'm sure you've all felt it. You meet someone for the first time and you feel intuitive. You look at him you say, I don't like the look of that man. Or, uh, he's got a nice, attractive smile. Of course, sometimes we're sadly mistaken because we're sinful in our assessments. But often, our assessment is right on and altogether accurate. I know my wife is absolutely uncanny at this. She can size a person up one second after she's seen them and 99% of the time she's 100% right a couple of years later, I say, you know, you were right. She says, yeah, I told you so. <laughs> Women are very good at this, you know. Men laboriously have to rack their brains and construct an argument over months. Uh, woman's intuition, she comes at the solution immediately. But of course, when a woman makes a mistake in this intuition, she's very, very wrong. So you do need both processes, the immediate awareness and intuition, and of course, figuring the thing out in the in the laborious, masculine way. Two should control one another. Uh, the development of personality, our personality develops. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, talked like a child, understood like a child, but now that I'm a man, I've put away childish things. But it's the same me. Personality has undergone growth. Not only has the body grown, but so has the soul and the personality within the soul. We're constantly enriching our personality as we live. So we grow through childhood, youth, adulthood, and 
personality. Sadly, personality can also become perverted as a result of the fall, as in the case of Cain or King Saul, a tragic figure. A man, uh, a man who, uh, we're told that Saul became a new man at one point in Scripture, and his life ended up in, in suicide. Tragic. And, of course, Judas, another very tragic figure. But then we also aware of the regeneration of personality, how the Lord can take someone whose life is crushed and destroyed with sin, someone who's despaired and been abandoned and abandoned himself. The Lord touches them, and heals them, and they live again. And more spectacularly still, when the Lord can take deeply religious people and leaders like Nicodemus and Paul and make them realize they had nothing and they were dead until they met Jesus. The personality, after being regenerated, uh, must become sanctified. It develops from glory unto glory. And finally, after death, we have the perfection of personality. Now, looking at the human body, we can, I think, be short, shorter. Uh, like the personality, the body originates at conception. Uh, the chemical structure of the body, I've gone into this in considerable detail in Origin and Destiny of Man, so I'll just mention here in passing. When you look at our body, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. We're composed of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen. Consider the mechanical structure of our body, of how uh, your hand can grab things and pick them up and dump them on your tongue, and that can be shoved down the chute into your stomach, almost like a factory. Uh, as we labor, as we eat, as we reproduce, metabolism, the way in which the food is absorbed uh, via our stomach and our intestines and ultimately processed and via the kidneys and the liver, etc., into the bloodstream. Amazing. The vital structure of our body, that which keeps it alive, the bones, the blood, the lungs, and also the vital functions that we need that we're not aware of most of the time, sleep respiration or breathing, digestion, and even involuntary thought. Have you ever considered how wonderful it is when you drive a car? Uh, you're not even conscious half of the time of looking through the windshield, and yet all the time your brain is utilizing the eye to take in messages from the oncoming traffic. This is all being processed and computerized, uh, and there's a system of checks and balances much more effective than the U.S. constitutions even... Uh, which is making allowances for the way in which you turn the wheel with your hands, the way you hear sounds, the extent to which you depress the accelerator pedal with your foot. Uh, one package deal. And all of this taking place involuntarily, almost mechanically. It's incredible. Absolutely amazing. Better than any computer. Uh, then the body has a normative structure. That is to say, our... If, if, our, if, our, if our body is working well, its uh, physical uh, operations are subject to its vital human operations. That's subject to our emotions, our emotions to our thought, and our thought ultimately subject to our faith. The body can be developed, grows naturally, and of course it can be developed uh, unnaturally, supernaturally, whatever you want to call it, beyond the natural in athletics. The body can be perverted by sin or disease. The body becomes regenerate only after resurrection, but as I pointed out, I think the degree of degeneration can be slowed down by a wise living after we get saved. body is sanctified, even in this life, and even more so after its resurrection, and will finally be perfected in glory. The human soul, again, its origin at the time of conception, Zechariah 12, verse 1, I am the Lord that create the soul of man within man. It's an important text. The nature of the soul, it cannot be annihilated. It is immaterial. You can't chop it up or divide it into parts, as you can the body. It is mutable. The soul is changeable. Uh, often Christians have a strange idea, I don't know why, that the body can change, but the soul doesn't. That isn't so. 
our souls change when we get saved. should be changing the whole time as we more and more follow the Lord and are sanctified. And our soul is destructible. Notice what Jesus says. Do not fear them who can destroy the body, but who cannot destroy the soul, but rather fear God who can destroy both the soul and the body. Yea, fear him, I say. So we see that God can destroy, does destroy the soul as well as the body. The soul is destructible. I think the best way to regard our soul is to think of it as the hand inside of the glove of the body. Next time you put on a glove, take a good look at your hand and wiggle your little finger and your thumb. Watch the way the glove does exactly what your hand uh, makes it do. And that's the way our soul operates within our body, voluntarily and involuntarily. Our body does exactly, is programmed to do exactly what the soul wants it to do. And yet the soul is the personality kernel of man. The soul develops. Why art thou downcast, O my soul? Trust in God and I shall yet see him, says David. The soul can be perverted, and when it is, every aspect of the soul becomes perverted, the mind, the conscience, the intellect, the emotions. The soul can be regenerated, sanctified, and ultimately perfected. Now, man has a vocation as prophet, priest, and king. And to be prophet, priest, and king, he utilizes every aspect of himself his personality, his body, his soul. As a prophet, Adam was required to give the appropriate names, to speak the truth. A prophet is one who speaks the truth. Not just about religion, but about anything. So when Adam gave the right names to the animals, he spoke the truth of them, called them by their name. When he looked at his wife and he says, you are man in, woo man, because you were taken out of the womb of the man, that was a deep, deep truth that he spoke prophet when he said that uh, Moses Isaiah Jesus and preachers are also prophets but so is every Christian no matter what a job he uh, he does during the week a Christian street sweeper who assesses how much uh, trash he's removed and uh, how long it is likely to take him in the fall when there's a lot of leaves to pick up and who puts in a report to this effect with his employer is prophesying. He's declaring the truth about this operation as he sees it. And if he's a Christian and he can see this, then he can feel real good. He's arrived. He's in full-time service of the Lord as prophet, street sweeper. He doesn't need to climb on the pulpit to do that. Uh, well, man is also a priest. Adam was a priest when he served God in his everyday career. And please note that Adam was not a preacher. He was a gardener. That was his career. Aaron was a priest. And uh, deacons. And Jesus, of course, was also a priest. Offered himself to God on behalf of others. But man's also a king. Adam was crowned king over the whole of creation. When we subdue the earth... Uh, we, are, uh, we are executing a kingly office and to the extent that each one of us is dominating some part of the earth in our kitchen, at the office, uh, collecting trash or whatever, we are kings. Uh, and it's wonderful for a trash collector to know that he's really a king at the bottom of it. Of course he is, if his, if his life's uh, surrendered to the Lord. All Christians, therefore are prophets, priests and kings you know and true Bible believing Christians don't just believe in the priesthood of all believers Protestants are always saying they, against Catholics they believe in the priesthood of all believers but I think we need to go a lot beyond that and say we also believe in the prophethood of all believers and in the kingship of all believers in everything that we do both here and now and on the new earth to come so finally then, man is called to render a total service to God with everything that God has given him, every particle of his body and his soul and aspect of his soul and his mind and his personality. 
Man has been created by the triune God, from God and through God and to him, are all things. Man's origin, his redemption, and his consummation have all been sealed to him by baptism in the name of the triune God. So when we're baptized in the name of the Father, we are to know that God the Father has created us and sustained us. When we're baptized in the name of the Son, we know that Christ has died for us. When we're baptized in the name of the Holy Spirit, we're reminded that this Holy Spirit who fills the universe, who gives life to plants, animals, human beings, and spiritual life to Christians so that they must, may live uh, spiritually and do everything to the honor of God. When we understand our baptism, when, when we see that in baptism we have been officially appointed to the office of believer to serve and glorify this triune God in everything that we do. Well, then we've begun to arrive. Therefore, as God's baptized and believing people, we are to eat and to drink and to dominate the earth and to be fruitful and multiply and to do all things to the glory of God while looking after every aspect of ourselves, personality, body and soul, for his glory.